Welcome everybody to a new series of At Home with Theosophy. Um, this series will be based on a book by C.W. Leadbeater that is called Dreams and it has a subtitle What They Are and How They Are Caused. Leadbeater was an important member of the Theosophical Society and relatively early member of the second generation of Theosophists and uh, he was he had he was a clairvoyant mm, a lot of information that is today available in the new age came originally from his researches he was the first person in researching on all the the unseen universe in a systematic way and uh, there he even discovered some atoms before science did at the time science had not discovered all the, the atoms and especially some forms that are called isotopes which are different forms of, of known atoms and he discovered the isotopes a few decades uh, before science or maybe less a few years uh, actually the person that discovered later on the these isotopes um, Dr. Aston he won the Nobel Prize for his discovery and he was aware of the researches that Leadbeater had done along with Annie Besant and in the speech for the Nobel Prize he had a footnote where he said that by theosophical means that he couldn't understand uh, Annie Besant and Leadbeater had discovered these atoms and even he, he even used one of the names for those isotopes that Leadbeater had used, the uh, metaneon. When he gave the speech, he didn't read the footnote, but that footnote was discovered some years later in his papers. So what we are going to see tonight is a result of his research, his clairvoyant investigation. He always would say that the way he approached this was trying to do it in a scientific way. That means by observing facts and trying to describe the facts that he would observe. But then he said, just like as in science, that they may observe facts and then the interpretation may not be correct or, or the fact may not be necessarily correctly perceived. With this, it's more or less the same. Um, he never claimed infallibility and he always put forward these teachings for our consideration. So that's how we are going to, to take this uh, study. The book is not so much about dream interpretation. As you will see, from a theosophical point of view, it's not that easy to interpret dreams because although there may be some general rules, each person endows his or her dreams with a particular meaning. So the blanket you know, interpretations are not necessarily correct. But uh, that's not what Leadbeater is mostly interested here. He's interested in explaining what happens during dreams because there are many dreams that are not just a psycho psychological production, as we are going to see, but are fragments of remembrance of actions on planes of consciousness that we are not completely aware of when when we are uh, awake and there are many interesting things related to dreams for that that impact our spiritual development so that will be the focus of, of this class so we will start reading some excerpts uh, Michelle, my wife, is with me and she's going to read the excerpts so that we have different voices. Okay, this introduction that you're doing today is from a different book, though. Yes, uh, Leadbeater starts the, the book on dreams, uh, supposing that people already know theosophy, the different planes in nature, uh, because these were small books that they, um, Bess and Leadbeater wanted to produce small books, so they didn't have room there to go through all the introduction. But since we have time, I thought that we could take the, the introduction or some fragments from the introduction of a different book by Leadbeater, The Astral Plane, 
that will serve as an introduction for dreams. As we are going to see, dreams are to, or, or the most important aspects, aspects of the dreams um, are memories of what takes place on the astral plane. So this is why I chose this particular introduction. We will start here. And this is from the chapter called Planes of Nature. Yes, from the introduction of the astral plane. No one can get a clear conception of the teachings of the wisdom religion until he has, at any rate, an intellectual grasp of the fact that in our solar system there exist perfectly definite planes, each with its own matter of different degrees of density. So this is the first point that we need to be familiar with. What we perceive with our five senses is, is called in theosophy the physical plane. Uh, there are other planes, or maybe we could call them fields or dimensions, on, on which we have also our being. So our being is a multidimensional being, multidimensional multi self that embraces far more than the physical. And uh, the, not only human beings, but the whole system in which we develop has all these different planes that Let Beer is going to explain. Now, each planes have all of them their own kind of matter, matter in a general sense of the word. It's not that, uh, the, for example, the next higher plane has physical matter. It has a, a subtler kind of matter, which for our perception may be closer to what we regard as energy. But those who develop clairvoyant vision, they can see the matter on, on the other planes. So each plane has its own kind of matter, its own kind of uh, energy, its own kind of consciousness, and it's a world in itself. So the first point to keep in mind is this idea that there are different planes. Some of these planes can be visited and observed by persons who have qualified themselves for the work exactly as a foreign country might be visited and observed. Just as any man who chooses to take the trouble can go and see this country for himself, so any man who takes the trouble to qualify himself by living the necessary life can in time see these higher planes on his own account. So we have senses to perceive these uh, higher planes, higher in the sense of they are subtler than the physical, now, not all the higher planes or the subtler, subtler planes are spiritual in nature. Actually, the, the plane that is immediately above the physical is, uh, in some respects, more material than the physical plane. More material not in the sense of denser or, or, or a harder kind of matter, but more material because that is the plane of the the highest emotions, but also of the lower kind of des desires and instincts and passions. So w whatever is non-physical can be spiritual or, or can be material in that sense. And um, how we relate to the planes depends on the purity of each one of the persons, uh, of each one of us. But the point here is that these planes can be uh, seen, uh, can be visited uh, the same way that we do on the physical plane if we spend time in developing these subtler senses. Now, in many spiritual traditions, it is normally regarded as a waste of time and energy to spend too much or to put too much attention on, on the lower of these subtler planes because they don't touch our inner self, the real self in us. So many traditions uh, prefer to skip the development of, of these psychic aspects and try to put all the energy and time that we have in discovering our true nature, uh, which is what can free us from suffering and, and from ignorance. Nevertheless, the knowledge of the subtler planes can help us understand life in a deeper way. And this is why Le Bitter and some other people have spent some time in researching this and, and bringing the results of their observations to us. 
The names usually given to these planes, taking them in order of materiality, rising from the denser to the finer, are the physical, the astral, the mental or devachanic, the buddhic, and the nirvanic. Higher than this last are two others, but they are so far above our present power of conception that for the moment they may be left out of consideration. So we have in the, the diagram they are a, a chart with the different planes and you can see on the first column are the Sanskrit words that are use, usually uh, attached to these planes. You see there that it, it is described as, as principles, principles of nature, because these, uh, these principles are like the, the original elements or the original mm, dimensions that constitute our, our, human, our humanity, our, our nature. Now, each one of these principles are or, or have their, their field of expression on these different planes. As Leibniz said, there is the physical plane and the plane that is above the physical in terms of uh, subtlety is the astral plane. Then uh, the, above the astral plane is what he calls the Vachanic, which is also sometimes called the mental plane. And then the Buddhic and Nirvanic. This Nirvanic plane is a plane in which people who, when we say a person reach Nirvana, that means that that person is aware, is conscious of its Atmic nature from Atma here. Atma means self, in, in the, the real self. So when a person is aware of its Atmic nature, of its true self, it is said to be in Nirvana. Now, to express on all these different, these different planes, we need vehicles of consciousness. So, just as to, in order to express ourselves on the physical plane, we need a physical body, where if you faint, for example, in the theosophical view, you are still aware, but you are not aware on the physical plane. You cannot perceive the physical plane, and whoever is is looking at you on the physical plane, they, they don't see any, any response. This is because consciousness pervades all the planes, but needs all these different planes, in, uh, ve uh, vehicles of consciousness or bodies, in order to be able to express on those planes. So on the physical plane, there are two bodies. We are not going to go into this in detail. The, the physical body and there is an etheric uh, counterpart. For the astral plane, there is what is called the astral body. For the mental or the vachanic plane, there are again two bodies, the mental and the causal body. The buddhic plane has a spiritual body. And the nirvanic plane, um, it has a vehicle of consciousness that is so subtle that cannot be called a body. And at that point, there is no real, really a difference between subject and object. So it's basically we we, we regard the atmic plane as the self in, in its own nature. So I see that Ed has uh, his hand up. Go ahead, Ed. Did you want to ask or comment anything? Yes. Isn't it true that, you know, the principles are active on their plane and lower planes? Yes, there is, there, is, um, there is a holographic nature to the universe. So even on the lower, lowest of all the planes, the physical, the, the seven principles are reflected. So we have the, the true self that is expressing itself through the physical plane right now. The, the one that ultimately speaking is perceiving all this that all this conversation is the true self. Now, the, sometimes it is said that this is a reflection of the, the true self. It's the true self trying to express itself on the physical plane. When that true self has a self-awareness in its true nature on the agnic plane, then we say that's nirvana. 
So it is uh, all the principles express themselves on all the planes, um, and in the plane that that they, they that is their their true home, that principle is ex expresses itself to the fullest. So yeah, that's more or less the idea. We are not going to spend too much time on this, but this is a basic knowledge that we have to have in order to understand dreams and their reality beyond just the subjective imagination in our minds. It should be understood that the matter of each of these planes differs from that of the one below it in the same way as, though to a much greater degree than, vapor differs from solid matter. In fact, the states of matter which we call solid, liquid, and gaseous are merely the three lowest subdivisions of the matter belonging to this one physical plane. So many times the idea of the of water in its three states is used. You know, you have ice, you have water, you have uh, vapor, and these are three different states which have can be used in different ways. With vapor, you you can use it to produce energy and you cannot use that vapor or you cannot use ice to produce energy. If you want to do that, then you have to turn ice into vapor. Or with ice you can build a structure and you cannot do it with the liquid or, or with the vapor. So even though ultimately speaking they are the same matter, for physical purposes they seem to be different. So the astral matter can be seen as a um, ratification, they, they say sometimes, is like a, a subtler aspect or form of the physical matter, but the qualities, the properties are so different that we can regard them as a different kind of matter. And so with all the planes. Though for the most part entirely unconscious of it, man passes the whole of his life in the midst of a vast and populous unseen world. During sleep or in trance, when the insistent physical senses are for the time in abeyance, the, this other world is to some extent open to him, and he will sometimes bring back from these conditions more or less vague memories of what he has seen and heard there. So while our physical consciousness is working through the body, we are unaware of of what is going on on any of these other subtler planes. To a, cer a certain extent, it is like uh, if there were right now a very subtle, quiet sound, and we all are w talking together, there's no way that we can hear that sound. But if, if we keep quiet, then we can perceive this sound that, for the most part, was invisible or uh, in inaudible uh, to us. So in a similar way, while we are in the physical body, our senses are constantly active, and that is a, 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 as if it were a constant noise in our consciousness that prevents us from perceiving these subtler dimensions in everything that, that we see around. Everything that is around us, it has these other subtler dimensions, but we can only perceive the grossest of, of, all, of them all when we are in the physical body. When we go to sleep and the physical senses uh, are for the time being in suspension, then our, our consciousness becomes aware of this subtler world. This also happen, may happen in, in a trance. A trance is a kind of sleeping process, but when the body is not really asleep, it may be in a state, in a kind of, of meditation. Although in theosophical literature, the idea of the trance is never necessarily encouraged because, as I said, it's not too different from the, the, the process of, of sleeping. What in the theosophical path we want is an expansion of consciousness while keeping our, our awareness, what in Buddhism they call the clarity of mind. In trance we become unaware of the physical plane and are aware of, of some other planes, but then when we come back to the physical plane we don't remember anything. 
uh, just as it happens during sleep. When we go to sleep, we are on these higher realms we are going to see. But when we come back to the body, we don't remember. And uh, some of the remembrances we have is what we call dreams. As we are going to see, there are several kinds of dreams. Not everything is a remembrance of, of the, the experiences on the higher planes. But basically, the idea here is that because of the predominance of the physical senses, we remain blind to all these subtler dimensions which exist constantly around us. When at the change, when at the change which men call death, he lays aside his physical body altogether, it is into this unseen world that he passes, and in it he lives through the long centuries that intervene between his incarnations into this existence that we know. The lower part of this unseen world, the state into which man enters immediately after death, the Hades, or underworld of the Greeks, the purgatory, or intermediate state of Christianity, was called by medieval alchemists the astral plane. So, coming back to the, the diagram here on the screen, uh, we are aware of the physical plane during our waking state. When we go to sleep, our consciousness goes to what we call the astral plane or becomes aware of the astral plane. Same, the same happens with death. When the physical body is dead, then our consciousness is centered on the astral body and after a while is centered on the mental body and then even on the causal body. We, uh, we went through all this process in previous series of At Home with Theosophy. But uh, what we are going to play, put more attention on is on, on the astral plane, which is the, the plane that is immediately above the physical, and therefore it's the same plane or the first plane that we perceive when we go to sleep or when we die. The astral region is the second of these great planes of nature, the next above or within, that physical world which we are all familiar. The first point which, is, which it is necessary to make clear in describing this astral plane is its absolute reality. In using that word, I am not speaking from a metaphysical standpoint. I am using this wo the word in its plain, everyday sense, and I mean by it that the objects and inhabitants of the astral plane are real in exactly the same way as our bodies our furniture, our houses, or our monuments are real. Look, that in the first paragraph, he says the, the plane that is next above or within. Remember when we say higher and lower planes, above and below, it's not, we are not talking in a spatial way. Uh, we are not talking that the plane is some, some, somewhere floating above the physical plane. It is above in the sense that it is uh, the matter there is a kind has a, a higher vibration than than the matter on the physical plane but the the astral plane is right here around us and uh, it, you can say that it is within because when our consciousness is looking outside it perceives the physical plane to perceive the the astral plane consciousness has to come inside to introspect itself in a certain way. So the, the idea is that the, the, the astral plane is right here, the mental plane, all the planes are right here if we are talking about uh, space. And on these planes there are objects, there are entities, there are forces, there are, uh, they have their own kind of space and time which differs from, from our experience of space and time on the physical plane, but they are not just imagination or, or something subjective in the sense of something created by our mind. Or if you want to see it in that way, everything is created by our mind, even the physical plane from a certain point of view. So that is what Ledbetter is saying here. The, the astral plane is as real or unreal as the physical plane. And we normally tend to regard the physical plane as real and all the rest is not necessarily so. But even from a certain point of view, the higher planes are closer to, 
to the ultimate reality. But we don't need to worry about that in particular. The idea here is that these plays are objective. They are not uh, a figment of our imagination. I know how difficult it is for the average mind to grasp the reality of that which we cannot see with our physical eyes. It is hard for us to realize how partial our sight is, to understand that we are all the time living in a vast world of which we see only a tiny part. Yet science tells us with no uncertain voice that this is so. We are, as it were, shut up in a tower and our senses are tiny windows opening out in certain directions. Clairvoyance or astral sight opens for us one or two additional windows and so enlarges our prospect and spreads before us a newer and wider world, which is yet part of the old world, though before we did not know it. Today, probably most of us are familiar that our senses perceive a very small um, uh, window of, of vibrations. So right now here there are all kinds of electromagnetic waves um, above and below what we call light. We see a certain um, uh, degree or, or of vibrations that, that we, we say are the seven colors. And uh, the, when the vibration is below what we call red, it becomes um, what we call microwaves. It, it ceases to be a visual or to produce a visual impact. When the vibrations of, of these waves go beyond the violet, we call, is, we call this ultraviolet, and then there are other vibrations above that, which again, they fail to produce a visual image. So we see a, a very small amount of, of uh, stimulus that, that is around us. In the same place, all this matter that we call mental matter, astral matter, and the matter from all these planes, it is right here. It is constantly playing on our senses, but we just cannot perceive them with the physical senses. Mm, the, the, uh, as we were saying, the physical senses are very limited even to perceive things on the physical plane, let alone the, the stimuli that comes from the higher planes. So when um, the subtler senses are developed, we, can, we are extending the, the degree of, of vibrations that we can perceive. So this is nothing in particular that will bring more wisdom or more peace or more happiness, it just brings more perceptions. For example, I'm a, I'm, my professional background is as a scientist, uh, I am a microbiologist, and I know a world that probably most of you don't know that I can see through the microscope. And uh, so in a certain sense, I can say that my perceptions were wider than those uh, of the people that didn't work with a microscope. Now, we wouldn't think that because I, I may know some of the world of uh, bacteria, I, I am necessarily happier or more compassionate or, or more spiritual. I just expanded the degree of perception helped by the instruments that we, we generated with technology. So clairvoyant sight is similar to that. We, we can extend the degree of our perceptions and of course this brings some knowledge and this makes uh, or may help us understand certain things in a deeper way just like knowing the existence of bacteria help us understand certain things but in and of itself it's not going to produce a, uh, to change who we are. The, in the theosophical view this changing who we are or who we think we are, changing the perception of who we think we are, is something that belongs to the, the higher planes, to the spiritual planes, not to the psychic planes. The astral region has often been called the realm of illusion, not that it is itself any more illusory 
than the physical world, but because of the extreme unreliability of the impressions brought back from it by the untrained seer. Since most of the dreams we may remember belong to this region, are the result of perceptions of this region, we need to know a little about its uh, nature. The idea is that, as we are going to see, uh, the astral plane is very tricky, it's not very reliable. Mm, we need quite a bit of training in order to be able just to interpret in the right way what we see on the astral plane. If I could give any of you suddenly the, the ability to see on the astral plane, uh, you would probably not understand anything that you are seeing. And then after a while, after a while of, of, of learning how to interpret everything that comes through the astral plane, even then, the things that you would perceive for the most part, may not have anything to do with the reality of the astral plane, as we are going to see. So, because of this, in the Theosophical literature, there is always a certain degree of mistrust of this plane. Sometimes we tend to go to the other extreme, to the extreme of saying that the astral plane is, uh, you know, is something evil. Uh, the, but the truth is that it's a dimension in the universe there are good and bad entities good and bad energies just as you could say that there are on the physical plane and uh, the problem is that it's really tricky so we can be misled unless if we see on the astral plane we can be misled unless we undergo a, a process of training to know how to interpret this so the same happens with the dreams the dreams is even more difficult because it is the remembrance of experiences on the astral plane or at least the kind of dreams that we are interested about. There are other kinds of dreams as we are going to see. But it is a, a fragmentary remembrance of, of the astral plane. So it's not even the complete remembrance of something that in itself can be tricky or difficult to interpret. So this is something that is important to keep in mind when related to relating to our dreams. Why should this be so? We account for it mainly by two remarkable characteristics of the astral world. First, that many of its inhabitants have a marvelous power of changing their forms with protein rapid, r rapidity and also of casting practically unlimited glamour over those with whom they choose to sport. Just as the we, we know that vapor doesn't have any particular form and the ice does have a form. In the same way, the matter on the astral plane is not, as, it's not solid like the physical matter. So forms on the astral plane uh, can be changed very easily. The inhabitants of, of the astral plane, on, on the astral plane there are all kinds of entities. There are people who are sleeping. Remember we said when we are sleeping, uh, we, we are on the astral plane. Our consciousness is on the astral plane. There are people who have died. Remember that we said that too. When a person dies, that person finds it himself or herself conscious on the astral plane. There are also kingdoms of nature that have their own um, home or, or field of experience on the astral plane, just as we see animals and plants and minerals on the physical plane. On the astral plane there are some kingdoms that we call elemental kingdoms, gnomes and sprites and many other kinds of forces belong to these planes and they don't have a particular form. They can change their form, look what, in however way they want. They have their own kind of consciousness. Sometimes it is said that many of these elemental entities have a kind of um, childish attitude and consciousness. It's a consciousness in between animals and, and children, the, the kind of consciousness they have. And many times they just enjoy um, playing pranks on, on human beings or, or, or whoever can perceive them. You know, in any mythology, you have a tradition of these entities that are the tricksters. 
uh, that they try to fool people, to make, him, make them do things uh, that, that they don't want to do. So there, there are inhabitants there that have this possibility of changing their images and, and they can be mischievous in, mischievous in this way. There are also angels, there are also different kinds of entities we, we won't go into uh, in detail right now. But this is one of the reasons why the astral plane is tricky. We can never be sure that what we see is really what we see. A person may be presenting to you looking like a dead relative and it may have nothing to do with your relative. You know, all, all our memories are impressed on our astral body. So one of these entities could see that image on your astral body and reproduce it. And, um, uh, and then they, they can generate a scene around you or you can unconsciously generate a scene around you because the astral matter follows thoughts just like the physical matter follows your will so you will to lift your arm and you do it and that will is mediated by, by thoughts on the astral plane too you can think and that this thinking arranges the astral matter around according to your thought if you, if you don't notice it there are ways to prevent this, but if you don't know, you just begin to see your own projections. Uh, Lee is asking there, I have read that upon the astral plane, uh, that under every flower lurks a serpent ready to strike. Why is this? And uh, what principle is being referred to by this? Yes, that's a quote from the Voice of the Silence, and I think Blavatsky or, or, or the treatise that she was translating refers to this in, and there, there is another reason normally spiritual entities they don't go uh, so low as the astral plane uh, it's rare to find spiritual entities on the astral plane if they are there because that's a lower world for them if they are there they are there for a very specific purpose. Otherwise, they are homies on the higher planes. So many times what we, if we talk about percentage, most of the entities that we may find on the astral plane are lower entities, the entities that belong to the astral plane. And these lower entities, as we were talking about, they, they love to play tricks. So it's, it's always tricky. Now, with the purification of, the, of your astral body, then uh, the astral plane responds to affinities. So if the person is pure, he will tend to attract around himself or herself um, higher kind of entities. If our emotions are, are less pure, then we attract these other kind of uh, lower entities. So there is a whole physics of the astral plane, so to say, that we can't uh, at the moment go in, in detail. But this is one of the reasons why the astral plane is tricky and why Blavatsky regarded it in that way. And there is another reason that Ledbetter is going to talk about next. Secondly, sight on the plane is a faculty very different from and much more extended than physical vision. An object is seen, as it were, from all sides at once, the inside of a solid being as plainly open to the view as the outside. It is therefore obvious that an inexperienced visitor to this new world may well find considerable difficulty in understanding what he really does see, and still more in translating his vision into the very inadequate language of ordinary speech. So this is a, the astral plane has a one more dimension of, of, of matter or what we call dimension of space. So there is not, the perception is not only in the length, the width and the, the height, but there is so also a perception that goes to the inside. So in some way that we cannot imagine unless we perceive on the astral plane, you see at the same time the, the surface of the object and also all its contents. This kind of perception is impossible on the physical plane, but it is a normal way in which things are perceived on the astral plane. 
So when the person begins to uh, kind of X-ray vision, mm -hmm. so when the person begins to see on the astral plane, then there is a, 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 a time is needed to, to, for consciousness to learn to reorganize the perception so that, that it can understand correctly what it is seeing. And many times what we are seeing and we think belongs to somebody else, it, it really belongs to us. We are seeing our own projection or, or the other way around. On the astral plane, limits are not so, so sharp. So it's difficult to know what you are perceiving, whether the other person or yourself. Uh, you know, it's a different kind of perception. So in a, even in, uh, to a baby, it takes a, a relatively long time to, to organize the perceptions that are coming through his senses. The same happens on the astral plane. A good example of the sort of mistake that is likely to occur is the frequent reversal of any number which the seer has to read from the astral light, so that he would be liable to render, say, 139 as 931, and so on. In the case of a student of occultism, trained by a capable master, such a mistake would be impossible except through the great hurry or carelessness, since such a pupil has to go through a long and varied course of instruction in this art of seeing correctly. Yes, this is... Um a characteristic of the astral plane that things tend to be reversed or we perceive them reversed. Actually that happens also on the physical plane. When we see something the image is reversed in our eye and the brain learns to to bring back the, the, the object or the perception of the object in its uh, right side. Um, it is said that babies, at the beginning, they, they actually see upside down and when they try to um, touch the, 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 you know, your head, they, with their hands, they tend to go down. So this is interesting also because, it, I don't know here, but in my native country in Argentina, it is very common the knowledge that if you, you know, some people dream of a number and they immediately think that they are dreaming of a lo lottery number or something like that. It can be anything, but um, because we are so focused on the physical plane, we think that the, the dreams are supposed to be to enable you to live on the physical plane in a, you know, in a more materialistic, uh, uh, comfortable way when for the spiritual person it should be the opposite. The experience of the dream will help us understand the world from a more spiritual point of view. But at any rate, the, in Argentina it is, it is known that if you dream with a number, you people who, who want to, to play the, the lottery, they would buy the number as, as they had the dream and the reverse too. It, it, because they they know that this happens many times when you see numbers you see you see them reversed it depends on whether your consciousness reverses the the perception automatically or not so that's something also interesting mm -hmm. now we have a question here uh, nowadays there are many mediumship classes uh, offered online and in places in different places my understanding is that people are really trained to get access to the astral plane, but they don't necessarily get a hold of a person they are looking for. Would you say that this is a dangerous method, not really explaining to people what they are contacting on the astral plane? Yes, I talked about that in the in a previous um, class on, on or series on At Home with Theosophy when we talked about life after death. And, um, well, the... The astral plane is always tricky. If you really want to know what kind of entity you are connecting to, you have to be able to see more on the mental plane, which, especially on the causal plane, which, as the name says, is the cause of the manifestation of, of beings. So the manifestations may change, meaning a, a person or an entity may change their form, but if you can see on the causal level, you can see the, the, the true identity of, of entities. When a person only sees on the astral plane, then just 
as on the physical plane, you can be tricked, you know, and uh, with experience, we know not to trust, I don't know, an email that says, send me money, I am a friend of yours, I need your money. We, we learn not to trust these emails by experience. On the astral plane, there are many things like this too, but people who, who are just learning to, to, to perceive on the astral plane, they normally assume that whatever they perceive is true and is, uh, and is however they perceive it. So that is one of the intrinsic problems of the astral plane, that people don't have enough, enough experience and, uh, and they may be tricked. And also, as, as we were saying, on the astral plane in the theosophical view, most of the, the proportion of the, the entities that are there are more material entities than, than spiritual. Then, if the person doesn't even see on the astral plane, but it's a kind of channeling where you open up, you know, your 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 psyche to whatever influence comes from there, it's even more, you know, uh, more tricky in the sense that you never know what kind of entity can be coming through. So, traditionally, in the Theosophical view, all these things are not encouraged. The person may be lucky and be in touch with the a good entity, but it's just like playing the, you know, the roulette, the mm. Russian roulette, or uh, so we never know. And that that's why in theosophy the attitude regarding the astral plane is uh, at least careful. The master, or perhaps some more advanced pupil, brings before him again and again all possible forms of illusion and asks him, "What do you see?" Any errors in his answers are then corrected and their reasons explained until by degrees the neophyte acquires a certainty and confidence in dealing with the phenomena of the astral plane which far exceeds anything possible in physical life. So Lebeter is talking about here this uh, training on the astral plane. And normally most theosophists would say if you don't have a training then your perception will be naturally unreliable uh, unless you know you spend several centuries um, working on the astral plane and little by little with experience you begin to to figure out things and, but those people who become disciples and again this is a whole subject that we cannot go into um, but that are trained by one of the some some of these masters they are trained in a, in a normally in a very systematic way, and things are brought in front of the person. As Leadbeater says, there he's talking about how his training was. So they would bring something and say, "Is this a, the astral body of a person that is alive or dead?" Or and he would say something, and then they would correct him and explain what's the difference. And they would bring, "Is this a real entity or a thought form?" Is this so there is a whole training that the person goes through in order to be able to have a more reliable um, perception. So the things that he's going to talk about in this book is the result of his research after going through this training. But again, as we said at the beginning, that doesn't mean that everything that Peter saw is exactly how he saw it. He, he says, I did my best. I am... Um, sharing with you honestly my experience uh, but mm, I don't claim you know any kind of uh, omniscience about that so we it's just like in science as I mentioned with the, in the same way that we may trust some scientists if uh, the mm, if we trust the scientists then we can take into account what they say but we always know that things could be somewhat different in the same way, if you trust Lebeter, for example, then you can take into account what he says, leaving the door open for things to be a little different. Now, Larry is asking who trained Lebeter. In the Theosophical tradition, the idea is that uh, his master was uh, Master K.H., and uh, he trained him in this way. Lebeter explains in one of uh, the books how this training went on. The neophyte has to learn not only to see correctly, but to translate accurately from one plane to the other the memory of what he has seen. 
To assist him in this, he has eventually to learn to carry his consciousness without break from the physical plane to the astral or mental and back again. For until that can be done, there is always a possibility that his recollections may be partially lost or distorted during the blank interval which separates his periods of consciousness on the various planes. So this is another factor that makes all this perception or the bringing of the perception more, more difficult. So we have seen that the perception itself on the astral plane is tricky. Now then if you are going to communicate this perception by talking to people or by writing or by giving a lecture, you need to bring the, the experience that you have on the astral plane to the physical brain. That is by no means an automatic and smooth process. You see that when we go to sleep, we fall into unconsciousness before we are awake on the astral plane. And uh, in most people, if, if you could see from the outside, the person is aware on the physical plane, then as consciousness is passing from the physical to the astral, there is a period of, of unconsciousness, of, of blankness, and then the person is awake on, on the astral plane. Um, when the person awakens in the physical body, from the astral plane to the physical plane, the same happens. The person goes down to the physical plane, there is a period of unconsciousness, and then we awake on, on, in our body. Now, this this interval, uh, blank interval, as he says there, may produce a, 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 an important distortion in the memories that we carry. So in, in, in that passage to the brain, the memories may be mixed up, we lose many fragments. In most people, most of the memories are lost in, in that interval. So when, when we wake up, we hardly remember anything about what happened on the astral plane. So if a person is psychic and needs to, or, or if a person is aware on the astral plane and, and wants to bring back memories of, of, of the perception on the astral plane, for that perception to be reliable, there has to be the ability to, to pass from the physical to the astral without losing awareness. This is why the trance, for example, is of no use uh, in, from a spiritual point of view because the person loses the awareness on the physical plane. So what is needed, and this is with a, a training in yoga, this can be attained with, with effort and purification and lots of meditation, etc. The, the person is a, has to be able to perceive the physical plane while being on, on the physical body with no, you know, interval or anything. Just, it's like focus in your eyes. You are looking at the physical plane with your physical body, then you just change the focus of consciousness and you are looking at the, the astral plane. When this is possible, then you can bring the, the experiences on the astral plane, you can bring them back in a, in a reliable way. So this is another important source of errors in seers and, and clairvoyants that have to go into trance in order to be able to perceive the astral plane. Um, Ed is asking what if you work with a partner and yes many times they, they do that they retain a certain kind of physical awareness so that they can speak and some uh, a, a person may uh, can write down and uh, that is a, a possibility. It, it depends, I guess, on how, how skillful the person is to retain the, the consciousness of, of the multiple planes. Um, but the, what happens in many people is that if you see them on the, on the physical plane, that person would leave the body, the body would be like asleep, go to the astral plane and then the person will come back to the body and then the body will wake up and that process itself will bring distortion. So that is what Ledbira is talking about there. When the power of bringing over the consciousness is perfectly acquired, the pupil will have the advantage of the use of all the astral faculties, not only while out of his body during sleep or trance, but also while 
fully awake in ordinary physical life. It must be understood that the power of objective perception upon all the planes undoubtedly lies latent in every man, but for most of us it will be a matter of long and slow evolution before our consciousness can fully function in these higher vehicles. So we all have this possibility. In the theosophical view, as I said, the, the psychic senses are not necessarily what we are looking for. They enlarge the, the field of perception, um, but at the same time, they, they, they may overwhelm the person. You know, sometimes we are overwhelmed with the life on the physical plane. We complain that now there, there is so much uh, stimuli around and there, there are so many things coming to, through our senses and there are a lot of psychological illnesses that we have at this moment that they didn't have a hundred years ago because consciousness has a, a, a particular a level of maturity that allows it to receive a particular amount of information. So, if we force the opening of, of the psychic senses, what we are doing is bringing more and more information into our consciousness, and we may not be able to, to, to handle it. In fact, there are many psychic people that, are, that have nervous problems or psychological problems, or they are very irritable or, or you know, different different problems. So in the theosophical view the idea is let all this develop gradually as your consciousness matures and what our, our aim is generally in, in this path is to try to realize our spiritual nature. The spiritual nature doesn't have to do with our senses. The spiritual nature has to do with wisdom so to say, with seeing the truth behind whatever we perceive. Not with perceiving more, but with perceiving more correctly, with per uh, perceiving the, the truth in, in things. So that doesn't have any, any side effects. And, um, and, and this is what normally why in the Theosophical view we don't encourage people to work on their chakras or do these visualizations to develop psychic powers because many times it is a curse rather than a blessing. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. I uh, recently read an article that is zeroing in on the gene that causes Alzheimer's disease, and they think it's the same gene that allowed the expansion of the intellect in human in humankind. And so there's always a positive and a negative in uh, everything we do. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, that's very possible because even in, in homeopathy and in what we could call, let's say, occult medicine or chemistry, there is this idea that a same substance may be a poison or may be a medicine according to the proportion in which it is used. So in nature things are not necessarily good or bad, they depend on what's the right amount and in the right conditions. So it is possible that if we overstimulate something that, was, that is originally good, the overstimulation of that may result in the opposite effect. And that happens with many things, even with psychological traits. Um, a certain amount of responsibility is good. Too much responsibility produces psychological problems. Or the same with any virtue. You know, a certain amount of equanimity is good. Too much may produce a detachment and inability to relate to the world. So that's a, an interesting thing to keep in mind, concept. The first conscious introduction to this remarkable region comes to people in various ways. Some only once in their whole lives under some unusual influence become sensitive enough to recognize the presence of one of its inhabitants. And perhaps, because the experience does not repeat itself, 
they may come in time to believe that on that occasion they must have been the victims of hallucination. Others find themselves with increasing frequency seeing and hearing something to which those around them are blind and deaf. So we, we as humanity begin to have ta some contact with this, uh, the astral plane, for example. Uh, some people may see a dead relative once because the conditions were right to stimulate his or her astral senses. And that's something that happened once and because it doesn't happen again then we regard it as some kind of a imagination or something. Or we may see an angel or we may see an elemental or or some other people begin to to be more sensitive and, and their psychic sense begins to develop gradually and uh, and that's another way that happens. But for most of us, it doesn't happen in that way, but in the, in the next way that Lebeter explains. Others again, are per and perhaps this is the commonest experience of all, begin to recollect with greater and greater clearness that which they have seen or heard on that other plane during sleep. So when, when dreams have a certain quality that we are going to see, we can begin to recognize them as actual experiences that we have or we had on the astral plane and this is how we begin to learn about the astral plane or, or begin to to ex extend our consciousness little by little to to this plane not by developing any psychic power that can overwhelm our consciousness but by mm, extending our memory or the memory of our experience on the astral plane to the physical plane. Most of us are awake on the astral plane during the sleep of the physical body and yet we are generally very little awake to that plane and are consequently conscious of our surroundings there only vaguely, if at all. We are still wrapped up in our waking thoughts and our physical plane affairs and we pay scarcely any attention to the world of intensely active life that surrounds us. At this point in evolution, m most educated people are aware on the astral plane. Now that doesn't mean that they are aware of the astral plane. In, in many people, they are on the astral plane in a kind of bubble and they are playing with the memories of what happened uh, in, in daily life, with their worries, with their hopes, they are within a bubble and there may be a whole world around but they don't perceive it. And actually in many cases this lucid dreaming where the person flies and does this and that, that uh, many times it takes place within the bubble. So even though the person may learn to manipulate to a certain extent the, or move around the, the astral plane, still there is no spiritual development because the person is still within this bubble, which is a, a projection or an extension of, of our normal attitude in daily life. How many people we see around, and it may happen to us, that we are so self-centered that we perceive the world only through our desires, through our fears, through our needs, and we are unable to perceive the needs of people around or what is necessary at the moment beyond what I want. So even on the physical plane that we have been aware of the physical plane for thousands if not millions of years, uh, even on the physical plane we still are in a kind of bubble. So this happens more fre frequently on the astral plane. Question? Yes, I'll take, uh, we, are, we are about to finish the, the, the slides and then we will deal with the questions. Our first step then is to shake off this habit of thought and learn to see that new and beautiful world so that we may be able intelligently to work in it. Even when that is achieved, it does not necessarily follow that we shall be able to bring over into our waking consciousness any recollection of those astral experiences, but that question of physical plane remembrance is an entirely different matter and does not in any way affect our power to do excellent astral work. So this is our last slide. Uh, what Lebeter says here is that the first step in order to extend our consciousness to the astral plane is to break this self-centeredness, to learn to pay attention to the outside. 
And what we do on the astral plane is a continuation of what we do here. If we are self-centered here, we will be in this bubble on the astral plane. If while we are in our, in our physical plane, we try to live in a state of uh, uh, awareness and try to be mindful and when we are walking, we are looking around and not always uh, closed or shut up in our, our mental world. If we do this on the physical plane, then we will break that self-centeredness on the astral plane and we'll be able to have a life on the astral plane. As, and as we are going to see, there is a whole life that, and a, a whole field of usefulness that is available on the astral plane. We may be useful in many ways on the astral plane if we are aware of it. Now, this is independent on whether we remember it or not when we wake up. The ability to remember the experiences on the astral plane have little to do with how awake we are on the, on the astral plane. A person may be in this bubble, but has developed the ability to bring a, a, a remembrance of, of the things that he or she did on the astral plane. And then that person will have a lot of stories of, of things done on the astral plane, although they were all da done in this little bubble. And another person may be widely active on the astral plane doing all kinds of things and then when going back to the body don't remember anything at all. So these are two separate phenomena, the remembrance and the extent of activity on the astral plane that are not necessar don't necessarily go hand in hand. So the, the idea for for this, this first um, talk or, or class on this is to, to bring a certain knowledge of how the astral plane works and its nature and on its pra practical aspect, this, the, the need to begin to live in a way on our daily life that is not self-centered begin to live in a way where we are actually looking at things when we are talking to a person instead of being wrapped up in our desires and reactions and fears and hopes to really relate to the person, look at the person, listen to the person. This is how consciousness first on the physical plane breaks through the cocoon that we normally have and then the same will be done on, on the astral plane. So that's... Um, the, all the material for today. Let's see before we give um, the the word to. Yeah, let, let's see. There are some questions here. So, what is your opinion about schizophrenics? Well, many times it is said that these people are actually seeing entities on the astral plane. I don't. I haven't read any serious research by a, a serious clairvoyant that I don't know if there is any research done in that direction to see if all the visions are of entities on the astral plane or some of them may be produced by by our, his brain or her brain but in in many cases they just there is a veil a natural veil that this veil that is the reason why we lose awareness when we when we go to the next plane. This veil is protecting us from a perception of, of the higher planes, of the astral plane and all, all the other planes. And it's a natural protection for this reason that we were talking about, that we may be overwhelmed with, with all these stimuli. Now, this veil may be broken for in many ways, may be bro broken by the use of drugs, by the use of alcohol, by uh, wrong spiritual practices, meditations or visualizations, maybe broken by uh, uh, too, too strong emotions or, or stress. There are many, many reasons. When that happens, then the perception of the astral plane may filter down to the physical consciousness. And if a person cannot handle it, then it may become, he or she may become what we call schizophrenic. So I'm sure that at least a number of people 
uh, are actually in touch with, with real entities on the astral plane, but they don't know it. And in terms of hallucinations, yeah, that's... Um, it's possible, I suppose, that the brain may generate some hallucinations too, but I don't know... Uh, I don't know the, the percentage, you know. So I think Shirley wanted to ask something. He, she had raised her hand. And if you have a mic in your computer, you can raise your hand and we will give you the mic so that you can ask. Oh, it was an <laughs> error. Okay, no problem. Is there any other question or comment before we end our meeting? We, we can spend a few minutes on questions and answers, although we have been doing during the, the class, but if there is anything else we can go through. All right, so um, we will send tomorrow a, the, a link to the recording of tonight's, uh, tonight's uh, class, and then we will meet again next Tuesday. I don't know if the, I, many times I like to send like a practical exercise to, to do during the week just to, you know, not to leave the, all this only at, at the intellectual level. I'm not really sure if the, how much this book lends itself for, for something practical, but um, whenever there is a possibility of an exercise, I will send it. So to tomorrow I'll send this email with an exercise and, the, and a, a link to the recording and uh, thank you everybody for coming for participating and I hope I'll see you next week next Tuesday have a great week bye bye